Okay. Alright, so you can pan over to Sadiq and we can start. How does sound? And where should I be focused? You can just look straight. Look well, straight. actually, look at this camera for the intro. Over here? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, my name is Sadiq Colquitt. I am the founder and the executive director of the Plant Based African Center for Nutrition. We specialize in disease mitigation. Uh, with top lifestyle diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, um, hypertension. Uh, we also work with uh, cancer patients. And we do that through a myriad of ways from individual personal um, training with me and our staff. Uh, we have fun exercises where we invite people to challenge themselves to 30 days living uh, in a meat-free environment or an animalist environment. And we also uh, will sponsor special events or craft events where we'll do everything from plant-based barbecues to uh, special cooking engagements with uh, special themes like um, Louisiana or Southern food or traditional African-American fare. So that is the plant-based African in a nutshell. We've existed since about 2015 formally, but I've been helping people uh, starting with myself uh, for over 25 years, understand the plant-based lifestyle and how it can help you lead a better life. Okay, okay, that's a that's a wonderful introduction, Sadiq. You feel All me? Right. <laughs> um, it's uh, this is the second episode, second live from the living room podcast episode, and you know I want we you know we met through Wayne, so I Absolutely. wanted to bring you on because. Um, I just been into like like holistic health. Uh, a lot of people don't know that about me, but you know, around like 2015, I was taking an African American studies class uh, in college, and you know, he we were on YouTube, and you know, Dr. Sebi ended up popping up on my YouTube, mm. and you know, I watched it was like an hour long video, and I watched that, and I don't know for, for whatever reason, what whatever he was saying was making a lot of it was just clicking, it was just making a lot of sense. Um, so ever since then, I kind of just been like aware of, of like how the body, the body works and, um, you know, what we could do to be preventative about disease and stuff like that. Right. So that's kind of what led me to, you know, be interested in this topic in general, you know? So it's just, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast for sure. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Am I, am I cool? I don't know. You know, am I huh? comfortable? I mean, it's, it's, cool it's, it's you however, you want, however you want to be. Oh, this okay. is going to be like Thank a casual cool. conversation. Yeah, that's what you know I want to do, but I, I crossed my yeah. leg. I didn't know if I <laughs> so it was the, too casual. The living room, you know, this space was literally invented out of my own living room. Okay. So it was, it was invented for, so people could feel comfortable in the space, you know. Got it. Well, it's um, a pleasure to be here. Oh yeah, you know. yeah, for sure. Uh, so I got a, just a couple questions. You kind of went over your 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 history a little bit more, but like, just tell me more because you told me about your story and how yeah. you came to be in in this space. So I mean, can you reflect on reflect on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, born and raised in Chicago. Um, parents, I'm a first generation Chicagoan, so my parents are or were both raised in the South. Okay. My mom in Tennessee, my dad in Alabama. So food in our household was super extra cultural. Right. Um, and both of my parents cooked, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, it, Sunday dinner could be, you know, not holiday dinner, but just regular Sunday dinner could be candied yams, mm -hmm. um, you know, fried catfish, it could be, you know, um, chicken, it could be macaroni and cheese, which is my favorite, all time favorite dish, mm -hmm. greens, you know, green beans, potatoes, like just homemade rolls, that kind of thing. So that's that's the style of cooking that I grew up in, mm -hmm. Southern African-American cultural cuisine. Right. Yeah. And so um, but by the time I was 29, you know, um, I was going to the doctor. I was working in corporate America, um, feeling really good, I thought. Mm -hmm. And um, just at the doctor, getting a checkup, and she says to me, uh, Mr. Colquitt, you know, things look pretty good, but you've got this um, high blood pressure and your cholesterol levels are elevated. 
I'm going to write you this prescription and you'll probably have to take it the rest of your life. Wow. Now, when she said that, that jarred something in me. Like I wasn't health conscious. I wasn't, was you know 20, what I mean? Was I, 29. Was, I was 29. Yeah. I enjoy playing golf, like going to have a, a beer or whatever, you know, with, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm 29. Right. And, um, working in corporate America, you know, enjoying life mm-hmm. as I thought it. And, uh, but when she said the rest of rest of your life, rest of my life, I was like, that seems like a long time. <laughs> and then, so, I started looking into what I could do and it led me down uh, a rabbit hole Mm -hmm. Uh, and I had some friends that I just met at the time. They invited me. They said, well, you know, changing your diet because there's no Google. Right. right. That's, so I was going to ask you that. There's, there's, no, there's no Google. Google. The time, so. There's no Google. So you can't, you know, I can't jump on. Matter of fact, there's no smartphone. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I can't. It's not like I can jump on the phone and look for something. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's libraries, it's books. Um, and, uh, you know, really close friend says, hey, why don't you come, you know, try this um, vegan food at this restaurant? Mm-hmm. And uh, I knew nothing about veganism. Right. The most I had closest I'd heard to veganism was uh, vegetarians that I met in college. Mm-hmm. And both of them, you know, it was just a strange they thing. Was, they was like the, the odd ones on campus? Yes. Okay. At least uh, to me. At least, yeah. You know, or the, the brothers and sisters who ran into, um, you know, culturalization through the Nation of Islam. What's up? The volume is jumping in the red. It's jumping in the red? Yeah. Um, you can turn it down in the F button. You gotta hit the F button. Okay. You see it? Yeah. And then you see the value? Okay. It's like level. Yeah. And you turn it down a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was easy. Okay. And it's still rolling? Yep. Okay, we good. Yeah, so, um, or the, uh, the brothers and sisters that had run into, um, you know, cultural identity through Islam or the, you know, the nation of Islam Uh and weren't eating pork anymore. Right. Right. So that was my only exposure. So Mm -hmm. when, when I was invited to a a vegan restaurant, it was like, I had no idea, but, but what I did have on my mind was I need to see how this mac and cheese tasted because, Mm -hmm. you know, part of my living and existing was around my mom's mac and cheese. Uh Uh, and then mine at that point, because, you know, I was cooking for myself, living on my own. And um, so anyway, point was the food was pretty good. I was like, man, I could do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, it led to me looking into resources. And but what really clicked was I went back to the doctor about three months later. You know how they're like, you know, come back or you being completely vegan for those. No, no, this is just me on the way because I I phased it in. Right. I Mm -hmm. cut out beef uh, and pork and then chicken, fish and turkey. And the last thing to go was cheese. Mm. But on my way to letting cheese go, my blood pressure had already dropped back to the level it was when I was 18. Right. Okay. So all I had to do was finish the deal, mm-hmm. right? Which was let go of cheese. Um, but my journey was like super bumpy. I started out going to McDonald's asking for Big Macs with no meat. <laughs> so so the looks that I got and, and you know, mm-hmm. imagine walking into a McDonald's and like, can I have a number one with no meat? And looking at you crazy at the end of looking the at me crazy. Right? <laughs> and then the questions were crazy, you know, and, and they would just say things like, you know, you know, it's, I'm still going to have to charge you whatever it was at the time. Uh-huh. And I was like, I didn't ask. I'm not asked for this. I just want the Big Mac, the number one the fries and whatever. Is, that, is that because me. you just didn't know what to make? You didn't like have any like recipes in mind? I didn't. I, I, I didn't okay. at the time. Okay. And and even if you do, because I did cook at home, mm-hmm. but you're out in the streets, right? Part of your life is I'm gonna pick up something here, I'm gonna pick up something there. Uh, I was working on the the near west side of Chicago, mm-hmm. um, off of Grand, and so if I was gonna run out for lunch and still trying to stick with what I'm doing, mm-hmm. then you know I'd go get the Big Mac with no meat. Okay, makes it makes sense. Yeah, that's that's which that's, has helped me develop part of my philosophy. So okay, yeah. That's that's like an interesting way to like, you know, get into it. I mean, you know, most people do get into it because they have like some sort of like health scare. But you 
you don't want people to get to that that point at all. No, no. And according to the doctor, I wasn't in the scary range yet. Mm-hmm. This was, you know, the medicine was going to be preventative. My blood pressure was a little high, cholesterol. I was trending that way. So if I just took this pill, right. like the rest of my life, I could. But you probably would have had like hella side effects. effects. I mean, yeah. all all medic. There are there are no pharmaceuticals. Mm that do not have side effects right okay all right well um so talk about your philosophy like talk about your philosophy about, about food. my philosophy about food um well let me let me i'm gonna start recent and then i'll back okay. up so what we've been able to do in the last five years we are extremely proud of and it's it's what we've spent the last year actually you know going across you know state lines in different cities um, mm-hmm. we've even been to Belize but what we've been able to do is define what food is and mm-hmm. codify it and then create a formula which can give you your proximity to health mm-hmm. or your proximity to z- to disease so Defining food is something that has, in modern history, never been done before. Mm-hmm. So once it's codified, and then once you know what food is and what food isn't, mm-hmm. then you can really take control of your health. And that's that's what we um, have been teaching. That's what we, we live by. And that's our philosophy. So it is either food or it is food-ish. Food-ish. Okay. Right. So... So what's a food? So food has to have five things. Okay. Food has to have healthy carbohydrate and or fat. Mm. Has to have vitamins and minerals. Right. It has to have fiber. It has to have protein and it has to have water content. Okay. If it is missing any of those five, your body mm. biologically does not consider it food. So so let's say it's miss if it's missing one of those things it, so what the body does with does with it i mean like let's say it has vitamins in there but it don't have one of the other things right so, it's, it's incomplete it's foodish okay so 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 as far as like as far as like a complete food it has to be a whole food so i has to have those five so what about like uh you know we eat olive oil coconut oil stuff it's like not that. food not food so we're not supposed to cook with it or technically no okay oh. i mean i mean and some people's so, recipe like, is gonna be that, ugly that's a, <laughs> well no because there are there are ways to do it like when you're sauteing things i mean this may sound like you can saute things in broth mm-hmm. it could be vegetable broth i mean they extreme that some people use water um if you're going to cooking with recipes you can use the liquid off of chickpeas which is called aquafaba mm. which literally means bean water you know aquafaba has an oil like consistency to it so you mm. can make dressings out of it like there are all kinds of ways you, you know out of the box to go around oil where you can still get the consistency mm. um um uh, that you want in certain products but by oil is so interesting because it is viewed as such a necessary part of the culinary world, but really it's only in the last hundred years because prior to that, what it would take for you to make oil was is an extremely labor intensive product, right? And so to get the the amount of oil that we have in modern society is through mechanization, mm-hmm. is through you know, extreme processing methods because um it just takes a lot to get oil. Yeah, because it's like if you need like a lot of olives to make olive oil. Like Man, like you gotta you gotta like um, I think the number is, I mean, we could Google it, but I think it, it's like close to 300 or some olives just mm-hmm. to get one tablespoon. Yeah, that's a lot. So you got to think about, and then the idea is when you are consuming food, so the olive has all five things. The olive has healthy fats and carbs. The olive has vitamins and minerals. Mm-hmm. The olive has fiber. The olive has protein and the olive has water content. Mm-hmm. You have to strip all of that out of it and just be left with the fat. And that's what the oil is. And that's what the oil is. Okay. Yeah. So that's why it's not that's why it's not, not food. Right. Okay. All right. So um 
I don't know. Like, what's some of your favorite recipes that you that you have? <laughs> um, I know you got the you got you, you guys cooking for Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah. Well, let's start with mac and cheese. Okay. Um, so mac and cheese has been my favorite, no matter what. Plant based, not plant based, but mm-hmm. that's one of my. Fa- and I don't really cook by recipe. Mm-hmm. So, like when you say I'd have to go more like one of my favorite dishes, favorite, okay, um, than than recipe, but mac and cheese, I would I would start there, and then there's gumbo. So, and like what then, you what you putting the what you putting in the mac and, mac and cheese to give it cheese? Well, cheese content, it, it right? depends. So you can make cheeses. You can make cheeses out of cashews, and I make cheeses out of all all these different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make cheese out of cashews. You can use nutritional yeast. Mm. You can um, you can use oils, or you can use aquafaba. You can make cheese out of um, soft tofu. Mm. Um, you can buy a store bought vegan cheese, and you can make a cheese sauce. Like there's all kinds of ways to do it. There's no one way. Okay. All right. So wouldn't you you probably need like a lot of cashews to make cheese though? Uh, I mean, you know, you could get a. a Oh no! I'm gonna come to the class. A bag, yeah. You can come, come to the, come the class. class. You can get a bag of cashew halves, and you you can you can make more cheese because it 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 goes a long way. So mm-hmm. it's not. Yeah, yeah, it's like late lately. I've just you know I'm not completely plant based, but like lately I've just been not feeling the need to like have as well. Um, somebody go get go get the door for walk. Um, yeah, I just lately been not feeling the need to even have meat in my diet you know when you go to the cookout it's like black people got to put meat in everything meat in the green yeah well that's the the that's the salad, culture you know? i grew up in that culture yeah so. yeah you got to throw it all on the grill yeah um, yeah but you know you're not a meat either so it I'm would not stand a, the I'm reason not a meat either or are you saying like the hu- human humans are meat um that's a nuanced question here's where i'm gonna go with that mm-hmm. historically melanated indigenous people mm-hmm. are not meat eaters okay is that and that has to do with um, the length of your intestinal tract? Well, yeah, you're not designed to be a meat eater, but then mm-hmm. there are several other things. So first of all, the length of your intestinal tract, the fact that you come here with no ability to kill and eat, mm-hmm. except that you would like. So if you like, what would you do if you got here? You know, it's a group of twelve year olds. Or, like the point is, is that other than creating a weapon, mm-hmm. how would you eat? If animals were your, if if they were your primary source, right, and then some of them you can't run as fast as they can, like you can't chase them. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 at a at a core. It when you talk a lot about of purpose to get to get meat. Well, I'm glad you said that energy. So actually, to get energy, I mean to get energy from meat actually goes against the law of the conservation of energy because mm. the first reason you want to eat. Is your body telling you you need more energy? Right. So now I see a antelope or an animal, or you're gonna wrestle with a cow, whatever it is, right? There's this idea that I'm gonna go chase this thing. Then you gotta kill it. Then you gotta drag it back. Then you gotta bloodlet it. You gotta process it. You gotta do all those things. Mm-hmm. And watermelons don't run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> they Peaches right don't run. Yeah. Avocados don't run. Mm-hmm. Green beans don't run. Right. And so if we're talking about intellect and I believe that our ancestors, our forebearers were extremely spiritual and intellectual. Mm-hmm. If your food, natural food supply doesn't run, why would you, why would go, you chase? go chase an animal? <laughs> You'd have to be another species in another part of the world where plant food was not readily available uh-huh. to even begin thinking about chasing an animal to eat. Right. Because it doesn't make sense. If you it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't compute. If I'm at my highest level of intellect and understand the design of the planet and know that a plant was specifically designed to go into the earth, I need zinc. Mm -hmm. But instead of me having to eat soil, the plant goes in, taps the zinc, transmutes it, changes it, Mm -hmm. lets it flow up into the stem, and then I could just pick the stem and eat the zinc. Why would why would I go chase an animal? Yeah, <laughs> don't make sense, man. It, it makes no sense. All right, so tell us about the blue zone. The blue what, zone. what is what is a blue zone? So, so um, I work with a 
uh, group of extremely uh, intelligent, sensitive, spiritual men and women mm -hmm. um, who over the years have helped to craft the concept of a village or an environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and its um, purposeful name is Restoration Village. It's about the restoration mm -hmm. of these uh, people, these indigenous, melanated, um, yeah, highly intelligent people, right? Like mm -hmm. restoring this to the earth, right? By controlling the environment. Mm -hmm. And the nickname for it is the ultimate blue zone. Okay. Because people uh, are becoming more and more familiar with, they did a documentary where they went to five places on the earth where people live the longest and they detailed about seven, eight or nine things that were consistent that ran through all of these places on the earth and they nicknamed these places blue zones mm -hmm. well the brilliance behind what we want to do is not go to places and look for the things that run through them right in terms of this longevity but actually create a blue zone mm -hmm. right where yeah, so how you go about go about doing that because what has one place i know i forget is it like is it is it fiji where the people live long, like really long? Well, there, there are a few places. And then, and then longevity is relative as well. Like, right. what do you consider? Like, if you're in inner city Chicago, living to 60 is long. Yeah. So, uh, but these are people getting. who, you know, going to their 80s and upward. Okay. I was thinking like 100. Yeah, 100 would be at the top. Okay. Not the average would be, but, but they be said at like the top. these type of people, they, they, they run a lot. They, they, they run a lot. They look at their diets. Basically, Basically, um, happiness, mm -hmm. connectivity and community, um, physical movement, diet, mm -hmm. um, and exposure to, you know, sunlight and elements. These are some of the things that run consistently through all of those blue zones. Mm -hmm. And how are you going about creating your blue zone? Um, uh, first of all, finding a place, right, where elemental exposure is um, not harmful, but elemental exposure is readily available. So that's uh -huh. that's air, that's sun, that's water, all right. Uh, right, and soil, because these things are necessary. And then understanding what the natural food source is, mm -hmm. um, and then understanding how we need to communicate, collaborate, and um, be in community with other elemental beings, with other indigenous melanated beings right and okay. share so that that's how that's the beginning of a blue zone of, yeah. of, of this restoration uh yeah blue zone that's something i want to experience at some point you okay said well you gotta, you gotta yeah we we started um uh, in belize and there's been quite a bit of work um done on it and we'll actually be headed back there uh this at the end of spring beginning of summer mm -hmm. um to you know, continue to uh, assess. Uh, there's plenty of movement there, um, you know, buying land and basically putting together this um, village zone living environment. Um, you know, it has a, a few names. Okay. All right. I got another question um, that uh, what people talk about when it comes to food. Like, okay. Uh, I know y'all keep talking about like the, the starches, like, Tell me why, like, start, like, we shouldn't have starches. Or should we, should we not have starches? Or, or? I don't. So I stay away from what. So let me put it this way. There are levels to diet and understanding. Right. And so because I live on the front line, and here's where my front line is. Mm -hmm. Stop eating animals. Okay. Starches do play a role in your biological health. Mm -hmm. However, everything has a balance point. So I don't want to criminalize starches, but you can't solely live on starches. Okay. So at a certain point, everything has to have a balance. You can drink too much water. Right. It's called drowning. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean you don't need water. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Everything's about balance. Okay. Um, so, 
you got any like you got any like interesting like testimonials from people um uh, that you've helped like like off the top of your head like somebody that you might have helped and you know heal essentially yeah yeah um we have testimonials on our website um i've got what's a, the what's the major one that stick out to you like a couple of the major ones over the years uh, I have a brother that I work with because this is continuous work. You know, I'm his nutritionist. Mm-hmm. He's a type one diabetic. Okay. And um, very special brother. And he started out at one of our 30 day challenges. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was a pescatarian before that. And he was like, I'm, I'm just going to drop, you know, I'm going to go on this, what we call the January jump off, which mm-hmm. is something uh, that we've done and we'll, we'll be starting in January again. Um, just a 30 day challenge, meat free. And um, he started there. And then we began to have more involved conversations. And of course, if you know, you know, type one diabetes is a diabetes that is, you know, it, uh, it becomes prevalent as a child, right? So uh, he had been diabetic for over 40 years, he was, you know, in his late 40s. And you know, we had conversation. He was like, you know, do you think this can really have an effect mm-hmm. on me? And I was like, yeah, I do. But this is also um, not something that's going to happen in 30 days. Right. right yeah. So fast forward three years later, he called me about three and a half months ago. It was this summer. and He was actually in tears because he's had an insulin pump, you know, most of his life that he can remember. Mm-hmm. And he's also a cyclist. And so he was out of town. He was in Atlanta at a race mm-hmm. or cycling event that weekend. And he was able to cycle all three days of the race. But that particular Sunday mm. was the first day that he did not have to push his insulin pump to get an injection. And it's because of the work that we've been doing through food. Mm-hmm. Um, over the last three years. And for a lot of type one diabetics, this is almost unheard of. Right. Like he couldn't remember, he was like in tears. He's like, he couldn't remember a time where his blood sugar stayed sta- stable. He was able to cycle. He was able to go through his daily activity and just did not have to keep worrying pushing or worrying about yeah his insulin level. So that's a huge biomarker uh, for him. But everything has gotten better. His A1C scores have gone down. Um, his level of activity and ability has gone up. He's lost a good, over over the time, he's lost a good 20 pounds. He looks great. He looks younger. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so that story resonates with me. Uh, about four years ago, I was able to work with a young lady who had uh, breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were able to collaborate because, you know, cancer is, first of all, nothing to sneeze at. Um, and, you know, when she came to me, this was her um, second time around, right? So the the breast cancer had, you know, reinitiated, represented, and uh, all the, you know, tumor was small, and she was forecasted to uh, need chemo mm-hmm. for I think something like, you know, seven to nine months. Mm-hmm. And you know, we got together, and she was like, I really wanted. She was referred to me. She wanted to work 30 days with me on being plant-based, you know, and that's what we did. But, you know, at the onset, and I told her, I said, what we do is in conjunction with what your oncologist and your doctor, you know, we're a part of what you're doing. We're not, you know, in opposition to. So she still did the chemo? Well, here's the beauty of it. Mm. She was forecasted to have to do seven to nine months. Mm. She did three weeks. Wow. And they were like, you know, we don't, we don't yeah. see anything. It hasn't grown. Like, there's no need to continue this. Mm-hmm. And that was because of the diet. Because we started the diet. She had time to ramp up before she even had to go into chemo. Right. And people just don't realize how um, effective, is- you know, if you give the body the space to heal. And I tell black men and black women um, when it comes to prostate cancer and breast cancer specifically, you know, because there are a myriad of yeah, cancers. Can you go get the door for a lot of... Let me tell you when he comes. She coming. All right, you can continue. Yeah. No, no worries. So um, I tell black men and black women specifically, especially when dealing with prostate cancer and breast cancer, because you know there are a myriad of or you know lots of 
cancers, right? Stomach cancer, lung cancer, you know, throat like, but specifically, we battle heavily with prostate and breast cancer. Yeah, I had a mentor. He ended up passing away from uh, prostate cancer. Uh, but this is a story, though. He ended up getting diagnosed with prostate cancer probably in his, like, um, late 30s, I would say. And, uh, and Dr. Sebi was actually his doctor. Um, and he was able to live until he was, like, 66. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, and... It finally, you know, it, it caught, caught up with him, you know, right. but he, he still extended his life, you know, 14, 15 years. I mean, what what would you, what would you, what does 14 or 15 years cost? So 20 or 25 years. Right. And, and I, I tell, you know, and to the women out there, especially the melanated, beautiful black women and black men that are out there, the two major accelerators mm. of breast and prostate cancer are eggs and cheese. And so if you're eating, if you're a woman and you've developed, you know, tumors, you know, um, you know, breast cancer Mm -hmm. before they get to cutting, before it gets out of hand. One of the major things you can do is to cut your consumption or totally cut out dairy Dairy. altogether. It's because it's dairy. It's not just, you know, but cheese and eggs seems to go together. It's almost like if you're going to have an omelet and eggs and the reasons are those two things are designed Mm. to be growth hormones and growth proteins, right? An egg is an extremely high level growth. Everything in the egg is about growth and it initiates growth because it is the only thing a chicken embryo will consume until it becomes a chicken. Uh It has no umbilical cord, it has no con it has no contact with its mom. It has no contact with the outside world. Everything that embryo needs to develop into a chicken is contained inside the egg. So that is a powerful um, growth hormone and protein that people crack open and eat every day. And if you have a wayward cell in your body that's looking, because all cells have to grow, right. they all have to have energy sources. Mm-hmm. And a cancer cell is a cell that has gone wayward looking for uh, an energy source that's not a part of your biological makeup because we were never made to go around and snatch embryos out of nests mm-hmm. and eat them. Right. <laughs> so because that is foreign to your body, you're going to feed the cancer. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with dairy or cow's milk because cow's milk is designed to take something that's born that's 80 or 100 pounds to 800 pounds in a relatively short period of time. So it is an extremely potent, extremely strong growth protein and hormone. So the main um, components of milk Mm -hmm. initiate growth. And it's the same thing with a human baby. So your mom's milk helps to initiate and sustain your growth over your um, developmental time, which you will grow the largest from the time you are born until you are five or six years old, is the greatest amount of growth you will ever experience in your life. Mm-hmm. And milk leads the charge in that. So it's going to initiate growth signals in your body. And so now you're actually supposed to stop consuming growth hormones once you get to a certain age. Your body needs no more growth growth hormones so as what, powerful as milk. So what was it like two or like what? It, it just depends like what, when you're supposed to stop consuming. Milk. No, you can go up to, I mean, your mom's milk. Yeah. We're not talking about like this, you know, but now we got our babies hooked up to cows Man. and Similac and you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so now you're drinking from. I was a Similac baby. You, you I, drink it from the, yeah, <laughs> for real. the breast of a cow as opposed to, and again, back to intelligent design. Mm-hmm. You got to think about what the universe went through to design the woman's body so intricate intricately right so divine that it would provide the exact uh the the exact amount of growth protein and hormone is perfectly calibrated for you Mm -hmm. and then we would turn our babies over to cows which that milk is calibrated for a cow and when you get a grown person's body 
and whether it's milk, cheese, or whatever, and you're constantly dosing yourself with these growth hormones back to cancer, if you have a wayward cell mm -hmm. that's now in your body and it's looking for an energy source, well, cow's milk now is the perfect source for the wayward cell because the cow's milk is also, your body doesn't know what to do with it because you're not designed to consume it. Right. So your body's like, what is this? And that's why I talk about lactose intolerance. That's why I talk about all these things. And if you are a melanated indigenous uh, being, we all are lactose intolerant, period, because we're not supposed to be consuming it. Consuming it. We weren't designed to consume it. I, you know, I won't say we're not supposed to is a is a heavy turn and we just we come to provide information so that people can make choices right and and that's really that it. was that was gonna be my next point like um just like as a, as a culture like what do you think you know we need to do in order to like you know move forward and and i would say just like in our evolution of like what we consuming yeah i think we need to uh push animal foods as far down the list as we possibly can because they're actually taking us from us way too early, way too sudden. Um, yeah, there are more black men that die from heart attacks than they do by bullets. And yet we are afraid of gun violence, but I mean, what really is taking us out and now it, you know, it's trending downward. It's no longer, you know, the, my uncle is at 60 fell over. I yeah. mean, I have peers, you know, I'll be 54 next month. Uh -huh. And I have peers literally at my Facebook thread that are going out every week. Mm -hmm. And then younger than that in their 40s. And I have clients in their 30s mm -hmm. that are facing heart disease, stroke, you know, heart attack, because it's it's all relative to the food ish mm. items that we we are eating and i just knew somebody he was 32 he tapped out of here from a heart attack heart attack like, and and heart disease is is you don't have to have it you know i use the word optional mm -hmm. right because here's how i describe it go back to the definition of food right healthy carbohydrates and fats vitamins and minerals uh fiber protein and water okay. that's food right food will never cause a heart attack. So you'd have to be eating something food-like or food-ish even to have one. Can't have a heart attack. Strawberries will never give you a heart attack. Grapes will never give you, an avocado will not give you a heart attack. Green beans won't do it, black-eyed peas. You have to be eating something that is building cholesterol and fatty, waxy substances in your arteries. And the reason they build up is because your body doesn't know what to do with it. Because right. it's, not, it's not food. So the only thing that, for instance, you at birth mm -hmm. were perfectly calibrated with all the cholesterol. Your body makes all the cholesterol you will ever need. Your liver makes cholesterol at your particular perfect rate and need rate because you need cholesterol, right? Right. Yeah. But cholesterol is the beginning of heart disease. Mm -hmm. So how do you get extra cholesterol? If you already, if your liver makes all the cholesterol you need, how do you get extra cholesterol? You will have to have another source of cholesterol that's putting it in your body. And so let's yeah. be really practical. Mm. Other animals or mammals, mm. right? Just like you produce cholesterol, so do they. So a cow is going to produce cholesterol. Mm. And so the more you consume the cow, the more cholesterol you add on top of, remember, you're already perfectly calibrated. Right. So now your levels start to rise because one, your body is not getting rid of it mm -hmm. because your body is like, I don't know what to do with this. So it starts to build and this is how your cholesterol, so you know, we're eating chicken and fish and beef and they all contain cholesterol mm -hmm. on top of the cholesterol that your body already makes. So now you have high cholesterol, elevated cholesterol, it's in your system and it is building up inside of your arteries. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I got a I got a couple couple questions. Like, sure. Let's say like somebody they they wanna they wanna go to the gym. They wanna work out. They wanna be, you know, they wanna be bigger. Okay. Like, how does somebody become bigger in a gym if they plant based? Um. I guess they'd have to look at what an ox eats. Okay. 
You ever heard the expression as strong as an ox? I heard it, yeah. Yeah, but you know what an ox eats? What they what, what does an ox eat? Vegetables, grains. Uh-huh. Gorilla, strongest uh pound for pound mm. uh mammal on the planet. Straight vegetarian, straight vegan, no animal products. So what I'm getting at is if you want to gain muscle, then healthy healthy fats right um the right amount of the the right calibration of protein the right vitamins and minerals you're gonna gain muscle uh because it's it's a necessary part of the process you know an elephant has a tremendous amount of mass it eats grass all day right so the 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 amount of energy it takes and the strength that these because you're not getting ready to wrestle an elephant elephant can can crush you with this trunk right so, yeah, so strength and power uh, are born from plants. Actually, plants are the only really protein source on the planet. You said they're the only protein source? The major protein. I mean, you can eat an animal, but an animal is a secondary. Like, I mean, you wouldn't eat me. I got, I'm made, I'm built of proteins, but like, you know, we're selective about the animals, but it's a secondary source. Okay. Right? Because a so, cow, yeah. so- a cow... Gets all the protein it needs. So it's like you're just getting half the energy anyway. Less. Okay, even less than that. Yeah, less. And that is such a, a uh, that's such a great conversation in itself because, you, you know, you've heard the expression where people are the sun. Mm-hmm. Well, the only way you can eat the sun is to go directly to a plant because plants are the only things that conduct photosynthesis. They actually take sun energy and they make it into food energy. Right. And so if you're going, you know, you're going to eat a cow, it's the, you know, the cow gets its power because it's eating the sun because cows don't eat cows and chickens don't eat chickens. (laughs) So they don't they don't get their power and their strength because, you know, they're eating animals. We have been told and we have been in a major advertising campaign Mm -hmm. for more, you know, especially in the Western world. We've been inside of this for Oh, wow. You know, a couple hundred years, and it, it really is an advertising campaign for industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, like, um, just the food is completely different, and it's just like, um, like my grand the food my grandma used to eat is like completely different from what we even eat today. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. Uh, I got a question about fasting. Talk, sure, let's talk about talk about fasting. Like, what does that do for the body? Is that is that something that we should participate in? Or? I would say absolutely um, everybody should participate in fasting, uh, but that's also a level conversation, right? Don't go out there and try to, mm-hmm. you know. Fast um, for 90 days. And yeah, and, and <laughs> they're, they're, they're different methods, right? So I, yeah. do a, I do a 28-day fast every year mm-hmm. with, you know, no solid foods where I just do water, tea, Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and a few other things, Every, you know, towards the end of the middle, I may have broth and then I may break the fast with grapes or something like that. Um, but yeah, fasting is a way, one, to give your body a break, right? It's real simple, right? right? It's like, when, when do you ever give your body a break biologically where it doesn't have to deal with what you're putting into it? And then we're putting so much garbage into it. It's like, really, when does your body get a break? Because you're eating three times a day, seven days a week, um, you know, four weeks out of the month, 12 weeks out of the year, multiplied by however many years you are old. Mm -hmm. And if you've never fasted, your body has never had a break. Mm -hmm. And think about if you didn't have a day or two off from work. Think about how soon it would take for you. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be mad. So your body's stressed (laughs) out. Your body and your body is upset. And it's telling. That's what sickness is. Mm. Yeah. Your body is giving you feedback. Like, I can't do this. Mm. Not only are you consuming every day, every week, every month, but the things you are consuming are detracting from my life force. Mm. And so we see those things show up as aging. Mm-hmm. Um, the body breaking down, um, the loss of bone mass, right? All of these things have to do with overconsumption, what we're consuming, and the fact that we give our bodies no break. So fasting can be a very, very beneficial thing. Okay. All right. So um, we're coming up on like, I think it's like uh, almost an hour now. Um, but I just want to know, is there anything else that you want to that you want to say or talk about, you know, before we get out of here? Um Man, I just like to say, you know, if you have questions, reach out to us. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find us at 
PBA Center for Nutrition dot org. Mm-hmm. Um, try a challenge with us. You know, come January if you want to try 30, 31 days, animal free. Mm-hmm. Join the January jump off, um, and just take a look at it. Just remember that heart disease, in particular, mm-hmm. which kills eight hundred thousand people or more um, every year. Yeah. Um, that's the and real pandemic. yeah, that's that's the real that's the real pandemic. Uh, is optional, yeah. right? Is because of us eating things that are basically not food, and so is diabetes type two. Like diabetes type two is optional, yeah. and it is not a disease of sugar. It is a disease of fat and oil. So just want to make sure everybody knows that sugar does not cause diabetes. Like if you chase the sugar wheel, you'll never get rid of it because high blood sugar is a consequence Mm. of of the diabetic condition. It is not the cause of the diabetic condition. So I just want to let people know that disease, you know, diabetes, heart disease, some types of cancer, depending on where you are, there's no... Um, you know, definitive fit for that, but they can all be mitigated. They can all be lessened. And then many of them can be reversed based on our understanding of what we eat, how we do that, um, and just consistency. Okay. Man, uh, so, I mean, I feel like I've been enlightened. Um, I I think uh, a lot of other people have been enlightened, but that's, that's one reason I bring people like yourself on the podcast is because these are the type of conversations that I want to have in the, you know, in the living room. And I think this is the type of, you know, conversation that we need to have. You know, even in hip hop, you know, you got a lot of vegans in hip hop. You got, you know, NLE Chopper, I seen him at Vegan Deal. Um, and, you know, uh, what's her name? Chloe Bailey. She was, well, she was, but she pescatarian, but she still, you know, yeah. she, she gets it. Yeah. And even Rick Ross, you know, after he got out of the hospital, he wrote Di- Dice Pineapples. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know what, though? And there's a, there's a documentary called uh, They're Killing Us, uh-huh. which uh, it, it features, um, you know, people that are prominent in hip hop, talks about, uh, you know, it's got other celebrities, but it, it talks about the, um, the black experience in the neighborhood and the fact that there are factors that are being controlled that lead to our demise physically. So yeah, the, the part habits. of the hip hop community is really involved, you know, uh, in food. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, well, you say you say where they can find you, right? Yeah. PBA Center for Nutrition uh, dot org, uh, plant based African with a K, at gmail dot com. If you wanna if you wanna email us, but you can catch us on the website, and we're on Instagram. Plant based African again with a K. We're on Facebook, uh, so you can you can check us out there. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's gonna conclude like this episode, and I just want to say thank you for coming. Oh man, thank it's you been for been having pleasure. me. Yeah. That's a pleasure. Um, so I'm just gonna present you with one of these. Oh wow! This was uh, yeah. This yeah. is so. This is this is another like hat that I got with you know with the brand on there and everything okay. like that. So that's my gift to you for coming on the podcast. Oh man, you know? I appreciate it. I had to get you a a, a plant based African. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll be shirt. at the, I'll be at the cooking class. You know? Okay, you'll yeah. be there. Yeah. yeah, and then you can, you know, and then you can rock one of these as you make your journey because right. everybody has their own journey. Yeah, my journey, I want to get big and, and, and be plant based. I got you. You, need, <laughs> you should get a nutritionist. Get a nutritionist? You, yeah. you, you got to help me out. You yeah, I, I got you. I got you. No, we, we can work together. I got you in the gym and, you know, we'll get swole on plants. All right. Get swole on plants. Yeah, that's hey, a t-shirt. I'm about to say, yeah, trademark, yeah. trademark Trademark. Get swole on plants. <laughs> if I see it somewhere out there, I'm looking for y'all. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, y'all. We out. Hey, thanks a lot, bro. I really appreciate that, man. Hey, um, can we get a picture? Can we get a picture, uh, Erica, please?